Welcome to the Garage Network Podcast. Join us and the occasional special guest as we discuss everything automotive, from fixing cars as a technician, owning an automotive workshop or business, overall work-life balance, and even the occasional laugh. In this episode of TGN Talks, we were lucky enough to be joined by Stuart Charity. Stuart is the CEO of the AAAA. We talk about some changes that are going to impact all of the automotive industry here in Australia. So we hope that you guys enjoy it. So, I mean, probably the best way to start is, I think, a little bit about you, because obviously we see a name get, well, I see a name sort of around everywhere um, and understand that you're obviously the CEO of, of um, AAAA, but I don't know much about you. So what's sort of your background in the automotive industry? Yeah, uh, look, I've, I've had um, in various roles about 25 years in, in the auto industry. So I started off in in government, funnily enough. So I, I joined the Victorian government as part of their graduate program and then ended up in the automotive industry unit. So we're working with a lot of the local manufacturers, um, supply chain companies to, to, to the um, uh, local automotive uh, manufacturers and and um then uh, spent about three years there and then got an opportunity to move across to the federal government, but in um, Austrade, Australian Trade Commission. And my role there was running a global uh, automotive team. So we had a, a trade commissioner in, in Frankfurt, in Tokyo, Bangkok and Detroit. So then I ran the global team and uh, that was all about taking Australian companies to the world. So all, all those manufacturers whether they be aftermarket or OE that we're supplying to the, the, the local car industry or whatever, really taking them uh, to the world. So we ran outbound trade missions, uh, inbound trade missions and, and so on. Um, so after about six years in government, I, I really enjoyed my time but uh, and I learned how government worked, but I was a little bit of a square peg in a round hole in, in government. They, um, uh, things move very slowly there. It's very bureau, uh, bureaucratic and... and um, so I decided then to move into the association world and part of my role in Australia was to work with a lot of the different automotive industry associations. So I cut my teeth on um, an organisation called the Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE. Um, they're a professional association, mainly graduate engineers and, and um, do a lot of training, professional development, accreditation, uh, also run the Formula SAE competition, which is a university-based sort of project competition where uh, they, they they actually build a, a, a car, basically a race car, and and um, and are assessed across a whole different uh, a lot of different criteria from you know dynamic and sprint and and uh, and so on. So really good grounding. And then cool. uh, uh, fifteen years ago, joined the AAA, and uh, it, it was. I mean, time's flying. Uh, the AAA was a really different organisation when I started. We had about 800 members. We were almost exclusively the supply chain companies. You know, uh, so, you know, the, the, the Ricos and the Valvolines and, and uh, so on through to retail, but we had no repair and service um, membership. Um, we had about five staff when I started and... Uh, we had no government relations strategy at all and no impact on, on government. So I've kind of worked on developing a, the, and growing the association. We're now around 3,000, just under 3,000 member companies. About half of those are, are independent repairers. And, um, uh, yeah, I'd like to think we, we have a lot more impact on, on government and government behaviour and, and, and are a much more stronger representative body of the industry. So... It's been a bit of a journey. I've, I've uh, I really love automotive. I loved it from from when I was doing it in in, um, in government, and um, you know, it's the, it's the people in the industry that that, that really drive and motivate me. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. I, yeah, I think that's that's you've got to. I'd like to the, the SAE. Were they still here in Australia? They are. They are. But um, I mean that. Back when I was running them, they we had the four four local car manufacturers, and and uh, so it was a, a lot stronger organisation. I tried to convince the board not long before I left to um, to join up with SAE International, 
Um, they do a lot of the standards and that sort of thing, and they're in their yeah, yeah they're our they're our oil standards and all that. Yeah, stuff. exactly. That's Virtually correct. every standard in the industry is an SA yeah. standard, um, and they had this massive suite of different training, and and it would have been awesome for Australia. Problem was the SAE board were made up of a whole lot of engineers, um, <laughs> a lot of academ- academics as well, and there was kind of a they were kind of split between the US and and Europe. There's another organisation in Europe, and and in the end, I, I I got the offer at the AAA, and I thought that had more uh, upside potential, so I moved on. They're around. Um, a guy called Adrian Feeney's, he's ex Holden. Used to run their proving ground down in Lang Lang, and he's um, he's running that organisation kind of on a on a part time basis, and and they've got um, a, a couple of staff. They still do the Formula SAE competition, so yeah, they're still around, but but probably in a diminished kind of um, yeah. role because of uh, you know, that that whole engineering from an OE perspective has really been hollowed out now. So. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah, and I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, really interesting background. And then the AAA has grown. Immensely, like the you, you, you well, you kicked some massive goals. You got to, I, I hold you directly accountable for our right to repair legislation. <laughs> so, thank you, thank you. I'll, uh, we'll, we'll take that mantle, not just me. Um, but yeah, I think the, the reason why the AAA works is, is because we're national and we're relatively small and, and agile. Um, and we represent the entire end-to-end supply chain. And I think the best thing that's happened to the AAA, as I said, when I started, there were no repairers involved. Um, now we've got you know, the repair chains and independent repairers involved. Um, and even though the activities of the businesses are different, our, our futures are all interlinked. And, Absolutely. Um, and as you know, uh, yeah, uh, Absolute overwhelming majority of independent repairers are small family-owned businesses, and on their own, they they're not able to take on you know, government or the car companies or or, or that. Uh, yeah, um, but and then you've got the supply chain that they they need you guys that, or they're not around. So we're all in this together, and and you know we we have a common position, and uh, and it means that. It, the the supply chain and the suppliers can step up and and really help you and through us uh, you know make a, a future for all of us and you know we've got a lot of challenges and you know we'll, we'll talk about those uh, uh, but but I think that we can overcome anything if 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 we're united and we work together and and that to me is why the AAA is what it is and and why it's grown. Uh, how it is, uh, you know, we we can provide the the clout uh, and, and the, the strategy, but you know, the mandatory data sharing legislation came about through absolute grassroots workshops, uh, writing to their local members of parliament, inviting them in, showing them what was happening, and and um, and really grassroots and and hundreds and hundreds of them doing that. So um, together, we're very powerful and. and and I think AAA is kind of the unifying force. Look, definitely, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some of my experience with AAA. Back years ago when I really didn't network with too many people in our industry, my first real eye-opening event was the AAA in Melbourne. Um, flew down from Sydney, thought, look, I'm just going to check this thing out. Um, would go to some of the little local ones, never was too blown away, and I was absolutely blown, blew my mind. Mm-hmm. Just seeing the amount of variety of people um, and also, like you said, a lot of the suppliers and the techs and the mechanic all, all chatting together, having this camaraderie was, was amazing to the point where the next time I went, I, I told my partner, you have to come with me and check this out. Mm. She was like, it's going to be all, all, you know, old people. Like, no, 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 no. You have to check this out. <laughs> like, this is bigger than, than what we think it is. It's, it's a big deal. Um, it, it, it's something to behold, isn't it? And, oh, you know, blew my mind the first time. Are. We own and run that show, and I still every time, you know, on that opening morning, I walk in there and I'm I'm, I'm loud as well. I mean, it's we are a buzz. significant industry, and, and yeah, it gives uh, you perspective. It gives you perspective on how on how it gives you a really good perspective on how big the industry is, and, yeah. and how powerful we can all be. Absolutely, yeah. and, and the, how professional yeah. we all are as well. Absolutely, like, we, we yeah. often you know, we always try and 
use it as an opportunity to bring politicians in to show them what our industry is all about and, and um, you know, the, the common thing as soon as we walk in the open the doors up is wow I didn't realize you, know, you yeah. were this big and they, they recognize all the brand names but it, it's funny uh, the aftermarket industry the, I mean, the, the automotive industry more generally um, has has been the, the car companies have hogged all the attention so everyone thinks automotive is just the car brands and, and then all of a sudden they see all the supply brands or, or you know, all the repair and service chains and, and, and our retail chains and whatever, and they, those are all familiar names, but, but they don't actually put them together as one big industry. That's right. Mm. Well, what I left there the first time thinking, wow, I've really got to up my game here. Got to, you, know, <laughs> you speak, walk around and speak to you. It's, it's very impressive, very impressive. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, one of the things... I mean, you guys do it, and yeah, while well, we're uh, handing out the compliments, you you guys do an absolutely awesome job in bringing this network of, of uh, independent businesses together and creating a community. But um, it, it it can be quite isolating, you know, working in small business. You know, yeah, you're, absolutely. You, you know, you're part of a bigger industry, but you, you you're working your business day to day, and you you're making decisions, and and uh, then all of a sudden you 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 go to something like that and you realise you are part of a bigger industry and and a big part of our role is, I, I say to a lot of people, I, I don't need a, a crystal ball in this industry. I just need to, well, I can't do it at the moment, but I need to get on a plane and go overseas and go to Europe and North America because yeah. everything that happens in Australia happens on a time delay of about yeah. three to five yeah. years. And so you can... You can almost get a glimpse into the future just by going to overseas trade shows and seeing what's going on. Um, but a big part of what we're trying to do in Australia through the expo, through the convention, through you know, a lot of the training and the information that we're putting out is is to help all the businesses prepare for the future. Because mm. the one thing I can tell you is if you if you just think you can keep doing, and I, you know, I know I'm preaching the converted here, but if you you think you can just keep doing what you, you've been doing for the last 20 years, you, 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 you're going to get run over, basically. Uh, I mean, this industry is changing so quickly and, and if you're not um, keeping pace with what's going on and, and, and investing in your, in your team and in, you know, in your business, you, you're going to get left behind. So, um, yeah, I think I've said job is, is preparing our industry for the future. Yeah, I think I've always said a few times on our network, the guys that always say, but that's how it's always done. Oh, it peeves me off. It's mm-hmm. not not a not a if, if that's how it's always been done, it means we haven't looked at it for a while. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I used to yeah. always, I, I'm that type of person. I hate I hate people saying, Oh, yeah, you, you can say, Why do we do it that way? Because that's why it's always done. Yeah. There's always a better <laughs> yeah. way of doing things. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's five ways of doing things your way, my way, the right way, the wrong way, and the boss's way. <laughs> <laughs> Just to clear things up, thanks, Mike. Yeah, just yeah. to clear that. Well, no, 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 I'll never forget it. But yeah, but I, I see the AAA as a, as a good conduit for, for independent repairers to connect better to our suppliers because we obviously, without us, they don't survive, and without yeah. without you know without their support, we don't survive, and without some of their and, and their, that whole partnership is 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 a really it's a good it's a good balancing act. It's a it's a good connection. I think Synergy, it's, it's a really important connection. Yeah, no doubt. And, and as I said, that's that's what, what I think we bring to the table. And, um, you know, it, having that national focus, most things are, are happening at a, at a national, at a federal level now. Um, so having that natural, national focus and, and we as an industry association, yeah, we are unashamedly 100% um, behind our industry and all parts of our industry. And one of the things that the, the car companies have done very, very effectively is that they've got their tentacles into everything almost. Yeah, they, they, they've got their, their, uh, their tier one suppliers, so they're all kind of silenced and a lot of those have aftermarket businesses arms that you know, get, get sort of, um, you know, the Chinese walls, the, the aftermarket can't talk to the OE part and whatever, and, and they, they control a lot of the industry associations. They had huge control. They were a massive, um, uh, and still are, a massive 
powerful lobby group, so they have a huge influence on government and whatever. And they were just they were just playing everyone. And then all of a sudden in Australia, we kind of came out of nowhere. And, and um, we have no affiliation to the car industry. In fact, we don't let them exhibit at our trade show. Um, we knock back their genuine parts ads for our magazine and, and, and so on. And and we just said we're we're taking you guys on and uh, and we're gonna we're gonna defend our industry and and we're their worst nightmare. Um, and, and I'll tell you they a lot of us there aren't doing, but their standing with government is is has never been lower. They because yeah. they've you know they've they've lied, they've they've um, you know tried to to yeah um, spread misinformation, they've they've breached Australian consumer law, the actual sees absolutely all over them. I mean, there's there's been seven or eight car companies that have uh, either been taken to the federal court and and, and lost, the, the car companies have lost, or, or they've had, had to sign court enforceable undertakings, which are basically um, the only way you, you can get out of court proceedings and whatever. So the ACCC, and, and every year Rod Sims from the ACCC comes out and says our, one of our major priority areas is the car industry, and he's just hammering them and hammering and hammering. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You've, knocked, you've knocked them for six, that's for sure. And then you probably, they've shown their true colours, I suppose, in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, they have. Um, the, the, they're arrogant and the, they're all about trying to control the market and, and using their, their might and their influence and, and their control over technology to manipulate the market. But uh, we've, we've called them out and... Um, and shined a really bright light on exactly what's going on. And, and um, you know, it's interesting, you know, seven years ago, the MPs, you, you try and say something uh, that, that, you know, negative about a, a, a car company and they didn't want to know about it. Now, they, their language has changed. They talk about them being um, uh, foreign-owned, uh, imported. Big deal. That's a big deal now, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Or anyone. Um, and uh, yeah, time and time again, I was talking to a cabinet minister or the industry minister last week, uh, former attorney general, and he said, oh, you know, what the car industry were doing and what they are doing to your industry is absolutely criminal. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting how the tides turned. And you know, that, I think they've, 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 they've kind of, um, you, know, you, you reap what you sow and, and, and I think they're, they're uh, they're starting to pay the price for some some pretty poor behaviour to not only the rest of the industry but to consumers as well. Well, yeah. that's an, that's answered pretty much my question. I was going to ask you, which is, what is just tell us tell everyone what the AAA is about. So that was yeah. the question's <laughs> gone now. Thank you. So um, they're pretty much getting the hammer and beating up. No, I mean, no, I'm, no, I'm joking. Yeah. No, I was going to ask you. Do you think that is the pushback from the head offices of the manufacturers, or is it more from the importers or the those bigger conglomerates that are the that are the ones that control the? I mean, this might have to be edited out. I <laughs> know oh, we're happy to talk. <laughs> I'm happy to talk. Like, like, is that the is it is it from the actual manufacturer themselves that the pushback or the you know really the dealer or dealer has been or has it been more from the you know these big international companies that have the 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 um, like so manufacturer level or dealer level, what, what you're saying? Yeah, yeah is it manufacturer? Yeah, no, yeah, is it manufacturer or is it the franchise? Like the yeah. guys that have the franchise to import those cars, you know what I mean? That's the yeah. that's more of the um, look, it, it, it goes right back to the, the manufacturer and their, their directives, the the global multinational companies, and and um, they set the tone. Uh, so whether it's their um, their their importer subsidiaries or, or, or what have you they they basically spell out um, what what you can and can't do and they they set the culture and and, yeah, okay. and so on um, the one thing I did want to say is the dealers are the kind of meat in a sandwich here as well they they're getting screwed over by you know they they're often you know, privately owned franchisees and. Uh, they're getting screwed over and dictated to as well, and they're starting to fight back through the Australian Dealer Association, which is um, a peak body that, that kind of sprung out of the MTAs that, that now just represents the interests of new car dealers, and and they're doing a really good job in in shining a light on some of the in, 
inequity in the franchise agreements. Um, you know, the, some of the stuff that car companies do to their dealers is, is, is atrocious as well. So um, everyone's kind of fighting fighting back now, but there's, there's no doubt that it, it's driven by head office. And that was their Achilles heel. And, and um, a lot of people don't, don't know this, but, uh, you know, what, one of our sort of trump cards in this whole mandatory data sharing thing was that we, we could go to our um, sister associations in the US and in Europe and, and, and find out how the car industry uh, fought this battle in, in, in the different jurisdictions. And they operate in exactly the same ways in exactly the same markets. So they had all the same excuses. We knew yeah. they were going to talk about you know, uh, IP. You know, we were stealing their IP. We, we knew they were going to talk about um, you know, uh, sa- safety, the fact that you know, independent repairs aren't, repairers aren't factory trained, so they don't know how to use the information and all that sort of thing. And, in fact, when we launched federally the you know, the, the mandatory data sharing or right to repair campaign, we printed a brochure that had the car industry are going to tell you this, and this is, what, <laughs> this is what's really, uh, really happening. So it was, it was a classic. And I remember we had Bill Shorten just before the the last federal election when he was odds-on favourite to, to be the next prime minister. Um, and uh, he, we had a, we had this um, TV crew in, in a um, workshop in Essendon in, in his electorate here in Melbourne. And um, and he had that, that brochure with all his notes written on it and he was reading from that and I thought oh here we go <laughs> <laughs> the, the next Prime Minister, he didn't end up being the next Prime Minister of Australia but we've got the next Prime Minister of Australia with, with our um, uh, uh, excuses um, a pamphlet uh, yeah. pamphlet so uh, yeah it's funny funny how things work out so that uh, being able to anticipate what they were going to do and, and, um, and be ready for it the international precedents is that it already, even though I believe we've got the best now data sharing regime anywhere in the world, we couldn't have done it if it hadn't been done in Europe and North America. So we were able to leverage that. And as I said, that grassroots support, that the power of uh, all you guys, uh, talking you and the, you know, the tens of thousands of other workshop owners, the, the power that you collectively have, if we put it in the right areas, uh, mm. is immense. It, it changed the game. 100%. Now, I think we should maybe discuss what the um, data sharing actually is because I'm sure most of the people that are watching at least have an understanding of, of what, what the magnitude or what it actually is allowing us to do. Did you want to maybe discuss a bit about what it actually is opening up for us? Yeah, so um, essentially from 1 July next year, uh, any any and all independent repairers, RTOs, uh, anyone in the industry can access all the information that's currently restricted to, to dealerships. Um, we have to pay for it. It's on fair and reasonable commercial terms, but nothing is off limits. Um, awesome. There's been a lot of talk about oh, the you know, security information, safety information, that sort of thing. But, but what I can tell you is the only checks and balances around security-related information, there's, there will be, and the government's working through you know, the, the rules, if you like, at the moment, but there, there will be uh, a fit and proper person check, but all that will essentially determine is that you, you, you're in an automotive repair business, that you don't have a criminal record or, or certainly anything that, that is related to theft or... Yeah. Um, a police check. And under, uh, yeah, essentially a police check, a national police check, um, and that you have a, a, a legitimate business. And if you're in New South Wales or WA, that you're licensed. Um, yeah. uh, and that's it. And then you'll get that security clearance and, and you'll get everything that um, the dealers are currently getting. So uh, technical service bulletins, you'll be able to do um, programming through pass through, um, software reflashes, everything that dealers get independence will get um it will be on for you know you'll have to pay for it but uh sure. it'll be on fair and reasonable commercial terms and there's uh, a, a pretty robust definition of what that means and we you can see internationally the prices of different um data and, and it will be pretty consistent with that um and if a car company refuses to 
uh, provide that information, they're in breach of the law. Uh, and there's an up to $10 million fine per company per breach. So uh, very, very significant penalties. Um, the ACCC are going to enforce this. We've already set up a, a team uh, there. The guy that's heading that up headed, headed up the um, Takata airbag recall, the mandatory recall. So he knows the car industry. They hate his guts. Um, so that's all going to go well. It's going to um, be excellent. Nice mix, yeah. Yeah. So there's... Um, and there's a lot of work going going on um, behind the scenes, and I'm happy to talk about kind of where I see the, the next steps. But um, what I can tell you is it is it's, it is going to change the game on, on one July next year, and uh, the law will be changed, and and um, uh, there, there's no there's no transition period. I mean, we asked the ACCC ACCC team directly uh, what happens if a car company is in breach. Uh, on 2nd of July next year, and he said, that, well, the law is the law. So, um, yeah, it, it's coming. Now, there's going to be a, a requirement to, to, uh, for, from, a, from an upskilling perspective for uh, technicians to know, you now we don't want everyone to start um, trying to uh, code, code parts and, and um, you know, reprogram ICUs and, and that sort of thing. There's, there's an art to it. If you get it wrong, it can be, yeah, uh, very costly. Yes. So uh, you know, there's some there's some tooling required. The J twenty five thirty four. There's um, uh, some skill sets required to be able to get um, our industry up, and and there'll be a transitionary program called um, um, the, the assisted uh, programming, um, uh, and until our industry's uh, got got the wherewithal, the training, and and, and tools and equipment to, to do it on their own, but um, you won't need to involve a dealer from from one July next year. You'll be able to do it all within your your own workshop. So that's awesome. Um, now, in terms of uh, how it's all going to roll out, there's there's um, the one thing the government hasn't done here, which they did also in the US in, in Massachusetts, is they were very prescriptive about what the car company, um, what, what each of the car companies had to do. Um, Whereas here, they've basically said, here's the law, you've got to comply with it, you work out how to do it. Um, so hand on heart, I, I can't say definitively uh, how it's all going to roll out because it will be up to each individual car company. But I could, what I can tell you is we are deeply in the process of leading them down a path where that we think is the, the best path to go. Um, what I can tell you is that there will be a, a new industry body uh, called ASRO, which is the Australian Automotive Service and Repair Authority. We'll have a seat on the ASRO board, as will the car companies and the dealers and all the different stakeholders in the industry. Um, and, and that body will oversee the, the whole scheme. It will run the secure data release model to make sure that security-related information is, um, is protected. It will report back to government on any um, issues with, with the scheme and make recommendations and so on. Um, and, and what we're uh, advocating for and we're, we're hopeful that the car companies individually will take up is we essentially want to license the, the whole US system. So the body there people may have heard of called NASTA, the National Automotive Service Task Force, they've been running this scheme, a, a scheme for uh, 10 years. Quite a while, yeah, they've had it for quite a while. Secure data release model, they work with all the OEMs and, and so on. And um, we've been talking to them for about four years, but, but in fairly deep discussions for the last six months to, to essentially licence their, their scheme straight across, um, have their website, like an Australian version of their website or have all the portals going to the, the individual car company, um, uh, data sharing, all the security and safety-related information is, um, is protected, it's all traceable, and... Um, the car companies will pay a, a small annual fee to be involved in that, but they'll generate obviously revenue streams through selling course. information, and um, and it's the same system that their parent companies are using in the US. So we think it's a no-brainer. But um, they're literally NASA is now presenting next week to to all the individual car companies to to um, get them awesome. on board. So um, hopefully that's the way it will go, and and um, uh, and. and We've got a timeline to be able to have all that in place and all the OEMs on board for, for 1 July next year. 
Awesome. I'm going to dare say it was quite a long road. <laughs> a long flight. Uh, I remember yes. hearing about this a long time ago, thinking, oh, it's never going to happen. But here we go. Like, I yeah, mean, I think early I was, in my uh, career, I heard this <laughs> happening and I was like, wow, it's happening. A lot of people doubted it, uh, including me at various stages. Um, I used to have black hair before. I <laughs> <laughs> um, I hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you, which you probably know, we have, we have a big banquet, at, at, you know, an awards to industry banquet at our um, expo on the Thursday night each year. And, and I can tell you, we launched, formally launched the Choice of Repair campaign at the 2009 Awards to Industry Banquet. So it was yeah. um, uh, only a few years, three years after I started. Uh, and so it's been a, it's been a long, long road. Um, I knew back then, and obviously, I knew what was going on internationally, so we kind of you know, took that and, and made it our own. But I also knew that internationally, that it was going to be a hard road. Yeah. Governments don't change the law just willy nilly. Yeah. Um, you, you need to go through a process, and I knew it was going to be a long process. So we were essentially ahead of the curve. There wasn't really a problem back then. We knew there was going to be one, and, and we launched it. Um, but we went through. So we basically launched it. We made formal approaches to all the car companies and they told us to, to uh, go forth and multiply and, and that there was no issue and that the parents had all everything they needed and, and it was all good. And, and um, then we lobbied government. There was an inquiry. The inquiry recommended a, a, a voluntary scheme and, uh, and then if the voluntary scheme didn't work, then a, a mandatory scheme. So we went to a voluntary scheme. We all signed an agreement. Um, you know, the minister was there and it was all, all great. Uh, that was in 2013 or I think it was. And um, car companies promised to be, you know, good, good corporate citizens. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then a year later, we, we could have done it two weeks later, but a year later, we, we, um, we basically declared the voluntary agreement dead. And, um, and then started lobbying and we actually were able to get a ACCC a a new car market study into the industry and that included mandatory data sharing. That's the gift that keeps on giving. That was also the start of all of the, because um, uh, the ACCC was shocked at what they found, not only in mandatory data sharing, but in warranty breaches and whatever. Yeah. And that, that started the process of the ACCC just absolutely yeah. going to town on the on the car industry. So, again, they brought it on themselves and, and the major recommendation out of that inquiry was um, uh, that, that uh, voluntary won't work. You have to go mandatory and uh, and here we are with the law. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's been a long road, but um, we knew it would take a while, but uh, I think we're on, we're on about eight different ministers. Across both sides of government, and um, yeah, three, four different prime ministers, I suppose, or five yeah, prime ministers. Yeah. Those. Well, that one stage, <laughs> few of those. prime ministers every three months. So, um, <laughs> no, well, I had, I was, I had, I had one moment. I had Craig Laundy, and I went, Craig, you got to come down. I got to show you this, and he was the minister. Yeah. And six weeks later, he wasn't the minister, and I was, he had a, He told me I've got an army of people. I'm sending him down to your workshop, and I said, great, no worries, get them in here. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll show you what we do. I'll show you how we're um, what we're doing at the moment. I'm showing you how easy it is for them just to flip the switch to turn this on for us. You know, like just uh, I've got a meeting tomorrow with Leslie Stewart that I'm going to show her the different versions from the US and in the, in the, in Europe and and the different prices and yeah. and how easy it actually is. And it literally is they both direct you to the same website once you pay money. So we just. Yeah, wow. We just need a front page that charges you Australian dollars. It's it's not it's not going to cost them a lot of money to sell. No, it's it's, it's not it, it's not at all. And that's what we've been saying all the way along. This is just an Australian paywall, and then um, yeah, putting Australian VIN numbers on on and uh, away mm. you go. I mean, oh no, I can tell you the Australian VIN numbers are already in there. It's yeah, the, okay, well, there you go. So so um, I, I can I can tell you that they are all in there. That yeah, you've just got to find them the right way. That yeah, they're, they're, but they are all. Yeah, on the Ford website, uh, all Australian VINs for Australian manufactured cars were in there as well. I can tell you, I can guarantee that on the even on the US site. Yeah. So, so it's just it's just GeoBlock basically uh, mm -hmm. for, for Australia. Yeah. And That's, um, uh, out of that voluntary agreement, the only the only company that, that um, uh, 
played ball was was ironically Holden. Yeah, it's for the AC Delco Global uh, technical side, they they kind of broke ranks, but no one followed them. But um, yeah, so it, it's it's not that difficult. They're still, they <laughs> still trying to say, uh, you know, that's the the car industry association, the FCAI, that's their MO is you know fear, doubt, and uncertainty, and it's it's going to cost millions, and it's uh, it's huge, and there's so many brands here, and it's going to you know uh, send them all broke, <laughs> and whatever. But like, surely like, the bigger picture, they're going to definitely generate some income back. Oh, surely, yeah. Yeah. like it's not free, right? Like you said earlier, it's going to cost something, maybe it's, not yeah. much, but something. It's yeah. sold to us under license. So. Yeah, surely there's going to be it's, a revenue to be made. Well, yeah. we're talking. I don't know what their yeah, the internal compliance costs are, but we're talking about you know, fifteen grand a year for, for a car company. Yeah, you know, we had a how much do they turn over a year in Australia? So. No, I don't even want to know. <laughs> makes me sick when I think about it. <laughs> that's, that's loose change in the back of the couch. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's fantastic. It was That was a, you know. Big win. Yeah, big win. Really. Big win. Thank you. Yeah, no, but thank I you. Have to... And we couldn't have done it with it without the industry behind us. And it's interesting, you know, you talk about uh, Craig Laundie. He, he's a great guy as well. <laughs> He was um, a breath of fresh air in in, in politics because he he'd had a real job before and uh, yeah knew, <laughs> knew the world. But um, I'd I'd uh, argue that it'd be virtually any federal MP that you spoke to about mandatory data sharing, they would know all about it. And that's how that's how big this is. Um, yeah, there'd be very few that, that don't know about this. So um, yeah, it's huge for our industry and. And I think it, it it puts us in good stead because it not only did it highlight the data sharing issue, but it, but it also highlighted how big and how important our industry is, Absolutely. how many people we employ. We've got workshops in every you know, town and 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 city in Australia. We we you know, we employ apprentices, family owned mm. businesses, and 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 you now we're providing competition and choice and and good value for Australian car owners. So. Yeah, it, yeah the, the profile that our industry has got now is, is never been higher. And uh, you know, I think we can leverage that for other things like fuel shortages and, and what have you, which are the, the next big things in, in the industry. Agreed. Absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Well, I, I, that, the, the part of I've just got, I've just been in a local chamber of commerce meeting that got on this one, and, and it was um, all about shopping local. And then the number of co- lockdowns being, Quite good for a lot of automotive businesses. We've been, I, I, you know, we've been pretty quiet recently, but we have done a lot of work for new customers who don't want to leave the area. Mm. Some positives, and 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 they're just talking about positives in, in general local areas about people, thinking locally, and having a completely different mindset to driving five kilometres to go back to the to the dealer um, to get their car serviced to rather than to go to a local mechanic, and yeah. really yourself as a dealership alternative which we really are now we, we can most look. most yeah most most shops around the school are now aren't they yeah and we, because we're on a level playing field like yeah that's right we were, we were all like you couldn't I, i've always said i hate sending anything away we do everything right so that you know and it was it was every every if you send a car away to back to the dealer you've lost the customer yeah mm. Uh, and it was really, we, I've never wanted to send anything away. We wanted to keep it in the house, do everything for them here and be able to do a true one-stop shop. Yeah. Um, well, and, in, and that's worked. In what other industry uh, you have to rely on your competitor to, to help you fix a customer? <laughs> doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, right? It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't make any sense. And, and my, uh, yeah, we, we've got, so many high, highly trained, you know, a, a lot of people that own and work in, in independent workshops are so-called factory trained. And, and, and I'll, you know, I've put a, a, a well-trained independent technician at, um, ahead of a, you know, a, a dealership technician every day of the week because you're seeing all different makes and models. You have to know, you know, uh, all, all the different things. Um, you know, a lot of the really... Uh, Difficult diagnosis is farmed out of dealerships because they just they just want throughput. Um, yeah, I, I had I had uh, I had dark hair once. It's all silver now. <laughs> this is multi branding. 
Multi-branded, <laughs> Multi- <laughs> multi-branded workshop. Hair. Multi-branded yeah. workshop makes your hair go. Well, I reckon. I, I've got it, mate. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, mate, I'm 45, and I think in another three years, and I'll be white. <laughs> <laughs> mate, you don't have a day over 42. No, oh, thanks. Yeah, but, that's, that's my dream is that, um, you know, we can just compete on our merits and, and there's no no barriers to, to what an independent can do to a, you know, to what a dealership can do. And then then you've got true competition and uh, and people have true choice. So, well, yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. And with that, leg- with that legislation, point. with that legislation, we've got that. Mm-hmm. Very good point, absolutely. So let's fast forward. If we fast forward a year from now, what are some um, potential um, challenges you see we're going to be facing? Do you see well, any? Look, I, I don't even think we have to push the fast forward button. Um, okay, I think excellent. The, the, the bleeding obvious one is the skill shortages. Um, yeah, okay. And, yeah, that's that's been one that's been around for, for a while, but it's, it's really ramped up. Um, and, and ironically, I think it... it, it it really sort of reared its head after we came out of that long national lockdown last year when, you know, there was a, that pent-up demand, people were delayed servicing and, and then they all wanted to get their car serviced at the same time. So workshops just were inundated with with um, uh, with vehicles and, and not able to keep up, so they were looking for, for staff. But it, it's a it's a difficult issue, skills, because it's, it's so multifaceted. Um, you know, we can we can say we estimate there's probably thirty a, a shortage of about thirty thousand technicians nationally, which is huge. You know, sort of nearly nearly one per workshop. Um, it's more pronounced in in the, the mining states of, of WA and Queensland, mm-hmm. um, and it's a it's a whole series of diff, different um, issues. So everything from um, you know, I think we've got a, a, a problem attracting good talent into the industry. I think that, you know, the, the industry doesn't have a great per, you know, perception and an image. Um, an image, yep. Yeah. Uh, so uh, um, so we, we need to work because we, we're going to need, you know, we don't need the, 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 you know, the kid that's dropped out of everything and, and you know, he, that's the, the last, last yeah, resort. We, um, we, we can't have that. We can't have the kid uh, that- Good at science and no good at maths because they're yeah. the two, they're the two major skills we need in this industry and yeah, yeah and I think I think cost I, I never thought about that but the mm. kid playing the the you said at the beginning the kid yeah. I always say it, the kid playing the good on the computer games kid that loves IT computers Lo- loves VR virtual, like, like, all those, like they're the guys that think about. Um, you know, things like ADAS, things like, um, you know, scan data and all that sort of stuff. Like you need maths, you need to be good with your sort of IT skills. And I think they're the guys. And Understanding programming, yeah. I think the problem is they don't even know what's involved. (laughs) Like they don't, a lot of the, they still think, you know, majority of of probably most of our days is spent more behind a scandal than would be behind spanners lately, for me anyways. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, yeah, I think we've got a job to do to, to change those perceptions and, and, and try and change the hearts and minds of people. Um, yeah. But before we do that, I think we've got a bigger problem in that, you know, half the, people, half the kids that come into um, automotive apprenticeships don't, don't finish them. Mm. Um, we're only attracting males. There's hardly mm. any uh, female yeah. apprentices coming in, so we're missing half the workforce, essentially. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, we, we, we've uh, we've got an issue where you know we were talking about this last night, Mike, that in that Capricorn survey, that only thirty percent of um, independent workshops uh, would consider putting an apprentice on, even though they know yeah, wow. that there's all these incentives and, and yeah. whatever from from government. I they're, they're not putting them on. It, it's a staggering figure. Like yeah. I couldn't believe. I can't believe that. Yeah. It's, okay. uh, it's, and you just and, and it's and they can't give you a reason why. Yeah. Other than and, oh, the, well, some of the reasons might have been the business wasn't growing enough, or we weren't yeah. busy enough, or that are too uncertain about the future, or those. Sorts okay. Of yeah, and and that frustrates me because you hear a lot from workshops, and we we hear directly, and and you know in forums and that sort of thing, everybody wants some someone else to fix the problem, whether it's government, yeah, <laughs> associations, us. But it's a it's a it's a shared 
uh, solution. And workshops yeah. have to play their role. You, you you have to bring new apprentices on, and 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 yeah, someone might coach them and and what have you. But if everyone has the attitude, well, I'll leave it to someone else, then um, no one does it. No one does it. Yeah. yeah, I think the problem that that the, there's a couple of issues there. Uh, and just to answer your question, the reason we don't have the retention right is to think because we're attracting the wrong people. Yes, I agree. So, I agree. so that there's that's a that's a yeah that one. If we, if we rewind and go right back to when we should be looking for them, we should be looking for these kids. I think I, I said it last night when they're in about year ten, when they're about six, to, um, yeah. trying to get them in that right mindset earlier on, and then to get the right attracting the right people the whole way through will keep those kids, those kids then we can keep them in the trade. The other thing is, is yes, as an industry, we are our worst, own worst enemy because yeah. we've spoken about this, Costa, because people go, oh, if you can pay your techs more, you'd retain, you'd, you'd retain your staff or everyone would be happier, but yet they're the same people that are not willing to charge a bit more or they're doing <laughs> They're plugging a scantle in and, and and letting the customer drive out of the driveway, or, or they're not mm. charging correctly for their work, or they, or they're also the guy doing the ninety nine dollar service, which we all know doesn't exist. Which yeah, it's just <laughs> going to be a race to the bottom. It, it, it's it, the, the, and you go well. Hang on a minute. If you stop doing that ninety nine dollar service and the service properly and charge three hundred dollars, then you can pay your technicians more. Then your technicians will be happier, and then you might retain more staff. And it's this whole. It's the, I think it's just it's we've done it to mix. look. I've yeah, said this before, Mike. We've, we've sort of done it to, well, not us specifically, but the, our industry. It's a little bit done it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we've sort of laid this foundation of the image that we have, um, but in saying that, we are the ones that can also change it. So I think doing steps that we are taking collectively um, and slowly bettering our image is the way out. I think once we start becoming more of a attractive industry. Um, yes. Both in not even even if you forget the money side of things, just attractive in the sense of how we are presented. Um, even as Stuart was saying, you know, picking the right staff from the beginning. You know, the guys that that do like all the girls that, that do like you know the math, the science, and and the IT stuff. You know, if we can start to maybe have that better image, then the rest yeah. hopefully will start to fall into place. Yeah. I, I, and Stuart, I don't know if you saw Costa and I chatted a couple of weeks ago to Scott Brown. Yeah, some of the stuff that Scott was saying, um, we were talking about. Um, he's talking about doing some. I, I said I, I, I need to know when he's doing them. I want to get involved because once he's doing some stuff, talking about uh, making some videos to educate his customers on how complex the cars are. Yeah, that was cool because they didn't know. Like he he went. He, his wife bought a new Toyota, and they got him with the sales the salesperson, and the salesperson drove around and and told him and his wife how everything worked. Right, and then. Mm -hmm. He got. He didn't say anything to them, but he got out of the car and he went. That was all completely wrong. They don't. Know <laughs> that's worked. And, and it was like he goes. I need to. I, he said. He's had customers approach him to go. Can you tell me how these things work? Because he was saying some things to us. Is you know we might work on someone's car and disable something, and they'll come back and blame you for for, for this other thing not working on their car. Ever since you. Touched my car. The, the the these beeps at me every time there's a car next to me because you've been turned on some lane assist or some other thing. So mm. he was um, a public awareness campaign. Yeah. Um, I personally think a public awareness campaign about our trade and how much we've evolved from my grandfather doing it a hundred years ago to today. Mm. Um, like a butcher, we, I talk about this. Like my analogy is, is a butcher is a, a cow is still a cow. A sheep, they still cut them up, right? They might cut them up with better knives and better tools, but the, the the cuts of meat haven't changed. And, and a doctor still works on our body. They, they've got more technology and other things to help them work on our body, but our body hasn't changed. A a, a, a bakery hasn't changed. The yeast, they all of those all of those other trades and those other fields. Things haven't evolved. We've had such massive evolution, um, and, and some of that's reinventing the wheel. Like my dad, who's eighty, laughs about. You know, we've gone back to starter generators. We, he had starter generators when he was, you know, seventy, sixty-four years ago. You know, like it was, it was that's what used to come out on cars. You know, they were, but 
just some of that, I think we need, I, I mean, I'd love the, the AAA or ARCA or, 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 or whatever we can do as an industry group to run a, a public awareness campaign to show how, yeah. somehow show how, how, what we've had to adapt to. I think we're very, very good as an industry to, of, of, at adapting. And I think mm-hmm. proven ourselves with that with COVID. Uh, and being able to, you know, we, we can work on the fly and we can move and we can... Very we can, agile. Yeah, we're agile, yeah. I think a lot, well, some of us are. Some are less than others. I mean, Costa, you and I work for two that weren't as agile as you and I are. Yeah. But, you know, obviously, like, well, that's our father's. That's what we're <laughs> no comment, he might be listening. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, look, yeah. I, I think everything's possible, and and uh, you know, in the same kind of spirit that we we tackled the mandatory data sharing when we, you know, we're all in this together. We, we you're not going to be able to service cars if you haven't got the the, the skilled technicians yeah. to support your businesses. So you know, once these things get to a, a, a sort of critical point, then I think the double AA can be a conduit. Of course, we don't have the funds to to, to fund a, a, a huge public awareness campaign, but if you look at the entire industry and the supply chain, there's some big companies there um, that will step up and, and support the industry for whatever it needs. Um, and, and I agree. I, I think now it's not quite the right time, but I, but because I, I think we need to fix, well, we need to understand what's going wrong in the system first, mm. uh, and, and that's what we're working on and, and, um, and trying to bring some government attention to it. Um, I mean, the other thing here is it, 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 there's a there's a safety element to this as well, and and cost. Um, if there's a skills, a real skills shortage, then that's going to push up the car, the cost of car ownership. That's going to um, force yeah. people that don't have a lot of income to, not to get their car service, so that creates safety issues and so on. So I think we can argue that to to government. Um, but uh, yeah, I think everything's possible in terms of doing some sort of campaign to 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 really change the perception. Because as you hit the nail on the head, Mike, um, this this trade and this industry has changed so much. I mean, the, the cars of today are completely unrecognisable to cars of 20 years ago. They're all um, um, mechanical systems on those vehicles, and 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 now it, it's all electronics. And and the, the electronic of content content of vehicles has just gone through the roof. Uh, yeah, there's more. Yeah, saw something. I mean, this was back in. I think it was a 2010 statistic, but there's there's, there's more um, more code lines of code on on the average uh, motor vehicle than there were, is on the the Dreamliner jet. So um, yeah, it's a uh, it is a high tech industry, and and um, yeah, we need to change that that perception because it's also a great industry. I mean, you you get to um, Tinker around with electronics and, and um, with, with cars. You can run your own business if you want. You can go into other areas of the automotive industry. You can work all over the world. Absolutely. The global industry. I mean, there's so many benefits to our industry that uh, that are not getting out there. And career advisors and parents and uh, that are advising kids on 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 where to go are, are, are basing it on what was happening 30 years ago. Yeah, back, yeah, back well, to I, saying that's how it used to be. That's how it yeah, always was. Well, yeah. Well, well, I've had, I had that. I had, we had an apprentice that that, that just wasn't fit for purpose. <laughs> fit for purpose, nice word. Well, yeah. no, it, it's, it's, it just wasn't the right. He just didn't have the right sort of attitude, and unfortunately, yeah. that was, and and the attitude came from mum and dad, who sort of can say, look, you're not good at this, you're not good at this, you know, why don't you go and try to be a mechanic? Mm. Mm thinking that it was, and I'm like, look, you, you, you're not following tasks properly. And, and unfortunately, we're going to an age where if you touch the wrong wire or you're not thinking about what you're doing, you're going to kill yourself. And I don't yeah. want, to, want to be ringing your mum to say that. No. Uh, right? and, and it's we're going into that into that hybrid, um, you know, the, the, you really need to have your wits about you. You need to know what you're doing and you need to be alert and aware. That's a good point. That's a, um, but yeah, I, I get, again, to, to say it's a great industry, it served my family for three, you know, for, for three generations. Yeah, me too. And we've, we've, we have, um, like, you know, I'm not going to say that we've made millions of dollars off it, but it's, uh, you know, like it, it was, it's been, it's a fantastic industry. Hmm. And, I, and I don't, I, I don't know whether my son will do it or <laughs> my wife might not want will to do it, but I, <laughs> wants to be a mechanic, I'm sure, or my daughter. Hmm. 
loves being in the shop more than anyone else. He loves it. So, um, and yeah, we need to we need to attract better people. We need to attract more people, and yeah. I, I, rather than importing some of them from overseas, because I know we talk about four, five, seven visas and stuff like that at times yeah. because of the skill shortage. It, it really fills the gaps for now. That's what it is. I know. Yeah, and look, and I, and I get that. It's a short-term stop gap. That's mm. all it is. Uh, but I, I guess that's another that's another avenue to put pressure on the government to go, hey, instead of importing them, why don't we try to get some of our own, you know, yeah. they're our cars. Why are we importing people to work on them? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Look, I, I think it's got to be a combination. Unfortunately, you know, once the borders open, the, the, the 457s are, are going to have to be a part of it because yeah. we're just not going to be able to fill the, the, that yeah. short-term demand with the pipeline uh, because of the, the, the time frames. But, um, yeah, look, I, I think we've got to look at all, all of those things and, yeah. and, and really get serious about um, what we do collectively as an industry. To, to because the next, the, yeah. the, I was going to say the next, we've been, we were so busy last year because I, what we went back to, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years, Stuart, so mm-hmm. I can tell you I haven't, we haven't been that busy since the 90s. Yeah. When, when before overseas travel went down, like you can really, the the holiday, people going away on holidays in their car hasn't really happened in Australia for a long time. People no. go on overseas holidays. They wouldn't generally go on too many driving holidays. Um, there was, that's what, there was the four-wheel drive market, which was ramping up because with all the people that go away camping and tow their caravans and, 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 and would go away. But last year, in the lead up to Christmas, um, it, we, we were absolutely inundated with work and, and mm. workshops were, as you said, and that drove that we're 30,000 employees down on what we needed. Yeah. Mm. I, I'd say arguably um, last year was probably the biggest year the industry's ever had. It, it yeah. was remarkable. It was across trade. It was uh, retail because people yeah. were stuck at home and, you know, project cars and that sort of thing, the four wheel yeah. drive, everyone's accessorizing their vehicles for the road trip, as you said. And and uh, and that surge in, in New South Wales and Victoria will, will come again as soon as the lockdowns are lifted. There's a whole lot of pent up demand out yeah. there. You're saying it was, yeah, you know, that's quite in your workshops now. Um, now we're fortunate, but one of the things we did early on was we, we lobbied all the state and territory governments to ensure that automotive was. Um, treated as an essential service. So we've been able to stay open. In New Zealand, auto's closed. Yeah, well. Um, it's, what is it? It's only co- absolute call-out. So if, if someone breaks down, um, then then you can open up your workshop, but you can't stay open. So, oh, wow. Um, I didn't know that. I, we had, I had no idea. Really. Yeah, so we did a lot of work early on to, to make sure that um, – that, that uh, our industry could stay open and, and then wow. actually putting out advice as all the lockdowns change and, and the, yeah. Yeah, the, the um, well, you certainly I, I reached out to you when Sydney went into lockdown, mate. You got back to us very, very quickly. Yeah, you've yeah, been very fantastic. quickly, very proactive. It's been great. Yeah, no, was... thank you. It's, uh, Leslie and her team have been amazing um, because every, every state lockdown has been different and you know, even the same state. In the subsequent lockdown, there's different rules again, and then there's not yeah. really, uh, regional and, and metro, and even in, in Sydney, you've got different rules in different local government areas and whatever. It's a patchwork quilt. And it's, yeah. been, and it's changing so much. I think you guys are doing a good job at, at yeah. clearing it up for us quite quickly, which is great. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, we've also got, um, obviously, the expo, which is a big thing. I think it's been delayed. Or when it was meant to be this year, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Yep. Hard to believe uh, when we're all in lockdown at the moment that uh, we are running an expo. Um, <laughs> but, um, we were originally going to run it in April. Um, we're, we're now um, on track for April next year, so yep. 7th to 9th of April. And, and I've got to say, uh, <laughs> if, if we're still in lockdown, uh in April next year, then God help us. So I think I'll be uh, <laughs> rocking in the corner uh, really slowly. Um, so look, I, I think you know, all the all the messaging from government and whatever, and and the, the roadmaps out sort of lend lend themselves to lockdowns being a thing of the past. Hopefully, yeah, you know, in in the new year, and and um, you know, we're we're uh, gearing up for for um, an incredible show. We'll have all the COVID safe protocols and everything in place, but because 
the show's got such a large footprint, we don't think we're going to be impacted by things like density limits and and, mm. and so on. Um, I've got to say, I've, again, I'm always amazed by this industry, but our our exhibitors have, have stuck fast, um, you know, every single one of them, with almost w- without exception, carried over their deposits and, and their contracts from this year to, to next year. So oh, that's we've fantastic. Got full, that's awesome. Full deck of exhibitors ready to go. We're, uh, the There is a huge amount of pent-up demand. I, I think it, everyone feels like they've been living in a cave for the last two years, so they're just hanging to get back together and, and, and you yeah, know, have that. That, that experience uh, of coming together and 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 so much is changing. I mean, it's such a pivotal time in the industry. So you know, we um, we're unashamedly focusing the the, the 2022 Expo on on the future. And um, you know, we're going to have a whole lot of technology. We talked briefly earlier on about workshop of the future. We're going to have a big feature. At, at the show where we're demonstrating technology, we've, we've got we'll have um, you know, EVs and and plug-in hybrid vehicles. We'll have uh, information on what's required to work on the vehicles, how to set yourself up as a as a workshop. We'll have um, we're doing studies on trend information to see you know when the tipping point's going to be when there's enough vehicles on the road to to warrant you know getting involved in in EVs and, and other alternative fuels. Um, there's going to be a whole lot around um, preparing for, for mandatory data sharing, what's involved in that. Um, so we'll have that workshop of the future feature. Um, we'll also have a lot of the training and, and, and information sessions on the floor, on a stage with an auditorium. Um, so we're keeping everyone in the show and keeping that um, that, that colour and activity and... and um, I've got to say, uh, I, I think that this next show is going to be our, our biggest and best ever because I think people just just want to um, want to get out and, and network again. So um, yeah, yeah, we're really excited about it. It's 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 free of charge for trade, so um, you just got to get yourself down to Melbourne, and um, I reckon Melbourne will be jumping by then, and and um, we'll be back into it. Actually, just saying that, um, for those that don't know, the AAA, being a AAA member, you become an ARCA member, which is the Automotive, uh, Automotive Repair Council of Australia. Yeah. Um, and then you also get, you've got legal advice, you've got, can you just, just give, I, I, that's what I, my, one of the questions I wanted to ask you before. Is yeah. Being a member, yeah. like for any of our member, our group members that aren't members of the AAA, um, obviously, you can attend the show if you're in the trade, um, which I did in the early days. Um, and and um, but being a member of the AAA has a lot of benefits. Yeah, look, it does. And I mean, we run the show. We also also run the auto care convention in the alternate alternate year, and that's that's more about training, you know, technical training, and and so on. Whereas the expo is more about product. Obviously, we we publish our magazine, and that goes out to the trade. But for for members. Um, we do provide a lot of services, all that COVID support, um, you know, there's detailed information that goes out as soon as things are happening. Um, um, we also spoke one-on-one with hundreds of workshops and retailers about their specific business circumstances and, and so on. So that one-on-one support. Um, we've got a, a legal and, and human resources service. So if you've got any legal queries, you know, so you've done work on a vehicle and, and you know, the owner's not returned to get the vehicle and, and uh, yeah, they've left it in, in your, um, you know, at, at your workshop and you sell the vehicle. Um, you know, warranty repairs, we talked about that at the meeting. Uh, so, you know, part fails, your supplier um, uh, will replace the part, but but not necessarily the, the later to, to re, you know, remove the part and reinstall it and so on. Uh, all those sort of legal queries, even things like lease agreements and that sort of thing, that's all uh, free of charge. If you've got any queries about um, uh, pay rates, obviously there's a lot going on, particularly with lockdowns around standing down workers and that sort of thing. So we've got a full HR, uh, human resources um, service to provide all of that guidance. Um, um, we do a lot of um, work around market intelligence, so um, trying to understand what's happening from a trend point of view, but also we have um, car park data. So for workshops, you can 
You can look at all the postcodes in your area and look at the the, the type of vehicles that are registered. Um, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I spoke about that on uh, Friday Night Live um, with the boys. I've got Nigel. Nigel ran the car park data for me. Yeah, here, which is fantastic. That's awesome. Look. Yeah. Yeah, it was just yeah. it was just a, ma- a massive information to go. There's that many European like you can you can, actually, you can structure your business in the right way to that what you, what your target market is and and what's what's where you're trying to uh, how how many of each different manufacturer in your area you know yeah that's right if you were thinking um, about specialising so we were yeah talking- that's right if you want to specialise or you want to do a promotion uh, you know, on on particular vehicles or you now when you're looking at scan tools and 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 you know what. Uh, what coverage you want, uh, you, you can you can look at that uh, that uh, local market as well to see what the what the profile is. Um, we've also done quite a bit of work in benchmarking, you know, good workshops against that, uh, uh, yeah, others that are that are behind. We call them the sort of laggards and the business as usual and the progressive workshops. Uh, so, what are the characteristics that that make a workshop? Um, you know, growing and 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 um, you know, uh, more dynamic and, and and changing to to their circumstances. So, learning from from the best, uh, if you like. Um, and the other thing that we're starting to do and we want to do more of, because I think there's a huge need here, is you know, it's all right getting people into the industry and that sort of thing, but there's a huge job to upskill upskill current technicians uh, to work with new technology. So. Uh, we've done. Um, we did a very, very successful roadshow of oscilloscope training. Um, we we were about to do a roadshow of um, scan tool training. So bring your bring your tools along, learn how to use them to their full functionality, and and, and so on. We had a couple of sellout sessions in Brisbane, and then we've had to pause that. Um, but we're going to restart that. Um, I think we're going to be doing a lot around J2534 uh, programming and, and, and so on as, as mandatory data sharing comes on. So um, so what we're trying to do is is, is build a community of, of um, you know, forward-thinking workshops that, that um, are part of membership of the AAAA. You, you're linked into all the activities, all the information we're putting out. You get invitations to all our events, all our training and, and so on. So... Yes, you can access the magazine and go to the expo and that sort of thing. But you, yeah, when you come into the inner sanctum, you, you're really part of it. And I think that's um, going to be really important for, sorry, yes, ASE signs. Um, just got, oh, no, uh, young, uh, young, uh, this is a ghost city. Yeah, I hope that's not a, um, I hope that's not a, um, a bad sign. But, um, <laughs> but ASE, uh, no, yeah. yeah. ASE. Hang on, let's get that right. Yokohama fell over, not AS. <laughs> That's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> um, so one of the things we are going to do is, a, yeah, is, a, is a, over the next um, year or two, is a, is a real push to try and get more uh, independent workshops on board as members because um, we think we've got a lot to, to offer um, as an association. And I think there's real benefits in, in you know, building that community further. So where we just got approval last week to put a, a membership development manager on in Sydney. Um, uh, we've obviously got Nigel up in Brisbane and um, we're just recruiting for um, replacing a role in Melbourne. So we've got Mike in, in Perth and so on. So, yeah, we've got that good national footprint and we're, we're keen to get as many uh, workshops as, as possible as part of the, the bigger AAA family. Awesome. I will That's actually cool. put a bit of side note. So I actually met Mike at the AAA. So we actually, believe it or not, um, the AAA was a bit of a springboard to get the sort of the garage network. So so a lot of the little bit of the core members at the time, maybe like eight of us, we actually hadn't met each other. And we had all planned to actually meet, even though we only work and live under 10 Ks from each other. (laughs) Obviously, with life being so hectic. Yeah, we all met. We all met. We actually all met at AAA. We all lived so close to each other, yet we all travelled to Melbourne to meet at the yeah. expo. And I think that's why I really had a always have a good time. We go. It's a really good networking slash yeah. meeting people that you, you interact with a lot as well. It's, it's a really cool place to be. But isn't that crazy though? That just shows how isolated the industry is or yeah. was. Uh, I think things are improving. There's, there's it is lots better. and lots of informal networks. Uh, springing up, and, yeah. and I think that's a great thing because, um, yeah, one of the things 
that, that I noticed a few years ago, and I think it is starting to change now, is that um, your competitor is not your independent workshop not at all. down the road in the next suburb or whatever. The, the, the competitor exactly. is, the, is the car industry and, and their dealerships, and they'll want to yeah, they want to steal all our business and, and, and leave us with nothing. So, um, you know, I think we are we are part of a, a community and, a, and, a, and it's it's really heartwarming to see that, you know, that those support networks spring up and, you know, I love just the, the information sharing that goes on on your, your um, Facebook platform of, you know, people saying, I've got this vehicle this particular problem and, and uh, has anyone experienced it? And then you yeah. know, five people will jump in and help out and, and whatever. Yeah, they're, so, they're very, yeah. engage, very engaged. And I think that there's been a, in my 30 years of looking at this, there was a, there was a you know, um, in the last five years, or, or well, since the last trade show, around the, from, the, from the last trade show in Melbourne to now, there's been a massive shift. And I think I people think so. come to the realisation that, I'm not. There's so many. If you, mm. you need to have a look at the car park data for your suburb, and you'll have a true understanding that there is so many cars in your suburb that you are not competing with the guy down the road. You're not yeah. with eight guys down the road or eight guys next door. There is enough work for everyone. There is. Yeah, just absolutely. To, we just need to market yourself right, and you can access that. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that really needs to. It, it's it, it, the generations before mine. I, I you know. We never really had much of a relationship with the guys down the road, but the guys down the road now come to our training and they come up here and they've been they're on the garage network and we all help each other and they ring you up. Right. Can I borrow that tool? Yes. And then one of them the other day, Frank was saying to me, How, how much do I owe you for the tool? I said, just take it. And he'd come back with a case of beer and it was, you know, I'm like, just use it. I don't, you know, I bought it, I own it, but just use it. Yeah. You know, do the job, bring it back when you're finished. Yep, and the guys in WA with Aston, they've got a tool library, so they yeah, yeah. Uh, basically. I, I do. I host the New South Wales Aston library here. We're, yeah. we're gradually building it, but these yeah. were these weren't the Aston tools; these were my tools. But yeah. the um, yeah, yeah it was, you make a you make a good point there too about marketing yourself. Um, and and I, this has got to change. Yeah, you know, we've we talked about charging for for your expertise and your time. Particularly around diagnostics, but um, and the, you know the race to the bottom on price, and we've got we've got to stop that. Um, yeah, we did some surveying; uh, it was consumer surveying, and price was fourth or fifth wow. most important thing in terms of a, a customer experience with, with a workshop. In terms of <clears throat> why they chose a workshop and 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 their their um, satisfaction levels uh, with with the um, with the workshop and you know it was about it was about um uh, buying local it was about dealing with the, the person directly that that owns the workshop um it was about having that conversation about uh different parts choices about uh giving people forward warning that you now something might need to re be replaced the next service um mm -hmm. but it was trust it was trust they trust independent repairers and, and yeah. you know they trust someone local uh so We've got to we've got to work on that and market that and, and yeah. market our expertise and our point of difference to the dealership. Yeah, they might have a, a fancy coffee machine and a and a marble floor or whatever, but it's very impersonal. Uh, you know, the, the apprentices are doing the work. It's it's a sausage sausage factory. We we offer a very different customer experience. So, yeah, as much um, as as much as that drives a lot of it drives a lot of you mad. I can't go to Coles or. or I can't go shopping because I see half a dozen customers, but that or, or go to the kids sort of embrace that and enjoy yeah. it. You know, like we sponsor all our local football stuff, and my son plays for the local rugby team. And I go down on a Sunday and man the barbecue, and you know, I see fifteen customers. Yeah. But it's good. it's That's nice though. Happens, and then yeah. it's it is not. Nice. It's just part of being. It's community. Like yeah. Sydney. I don't know whether Melbourne's the same, Stuart. You might explain, but Sydney's made up of little villages. Mm. And you're, you're like each suburb's like this own little village, and and you sort of, the, the there are, in the 30 years that I've been doing this, more workshops have closed in our area than have opened. There are half a dozen workshops for lease. There's not people knocking the doors down to try to spend a hundred thousand dollars a year to 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 go into them to you know to pay a landlord that sort of money. They just people don't want to do it. We're getting there's less and less people coming into the trade. There's enough work for us all. We need to stop being so competitive with each other. 
Um, we need to help each other. We need to learn to work together, and 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 it, it just and, we, and the industry will grow as a whole. Mm. Absolutely spot on. And and I'm I am really optimistic. I, I think the industry is turning a corner. I think that realization is is happening. And and look, you know, one of the one of the challenges the industry got is it's got is a lack of succession planning, and there'll be there will be a whole lot of people that have been in the industry for a while that have um, that will retire and and yeah. and, and have. Yeah, no one to pass the business on to because the kids um, and so on. So, uh, and I, and I think what you'll find is that over time, if we can get the the, the talent right coming into the industry, you're going to have a very different industry into the future. And um, you know, seeing into the crystal ball, I look at the US and um, the independent service and repair sector is very vibrant in the US and 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 is claiming back market share from from dealerships. Uh, and I think. You know, with the support of the entire supply chain and a, and a bit of a different attitude to, to how we run our businesses and how we price and, 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 and so on, I, I, I'm really optimistic about the future. I think, um, you know, independents are, are here to stay. They're, they're a huge part of the industry. They always have been and they always will be. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we've got, a, we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us and, and, and so on, but... Um, I'm certainly up for it, and it's a great industry, and it, and it's worth um, worth fighting for, and uh, yeah, and, and worth trying to shape to to the for the future. So, so you're going to yeah. stay for another 15 years? Well, yeah, I, my longest job prior to this was five years. So I used to get bored pretty easily, but mm. uh, I I haven't I haven't got bored in this job. There's uh, always kept you on your know, toes. Say, oh, now you've done mandatory data sharing. Uh, yeah, you're going to retire or move on or do so what are you going to do next um there's plenty more challenges um but, yeah. but it's great and and um you know the, as i said it's the people that i love most about this industry uh that they they really get me up every day and and um you know with a spring of my step and yeah it's it's terrific a terrific industry with terrific people awesome i'll agree good point absolutely yeah yeah well i met some great mates yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's been really good. It's true. <laughs> Don't forget to join our private Facebook page if you are an automotive technician and also subscribe to our YouTube and our podcast channel. They are all called The Garage Network. Thanks, guys, and see you next time.